Gaucher disease is, of course, a lysosomal storage disorder, one of approximately 50 to 60 in that category. Its hereditary pattern is that of an autosomal recessive disease. We know the mutation is on chromosome 1, Q21, and the name for the mutation is GBA1. This gene locus codes for production of an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase. This enzyme is either absent or has deficient activity in patients with Gaucher disease, and the degree of deficiency to some extent determines how severe the disease is. The common characteristic between all the Gaucher disease types is that the low enzyme activity leads to a buildup of this primary substrate, which is called glucocerebroside, predominantly in cells in the monocyte and macrophage system. The first picture is an illustration of a bone marrow aspiration showing what's called a Gaucher cell, a large cell with a rather small nucleus relative to the cytoplasm of the cell, which as you can see is full of uh, some stored material, which in this case we happen to know is the glucocerebroside. This Gaucher cell is very characteristic of people with Gaucher disease, but it is not totally pathogenic. Other hematologic diseases sometimes result in the formation of what appear to be Gaucher cells, so it's important to remember this cell is not absolutely diagnostic. In the adjoining bone marrow biopsy, you can actually see to what extent these cells infiltrate the bone marrow, and the same takes place in other liver organs such as the liver and the spleen. The disease has variable features. The age of onset can range anywhere from early in childhood or even at birth in the case of some of the uh, more severe uh, variants, uh, to clinical presentations which appear in adolescence, early adulthood, late adulthood. And the severity, as you can see, varies. The first picture shows a young boy, actually the first individual treated for Gaucher disease, and I think you can note the extent of the enlargement of the abdomen that he has. The second patient was a woman who, of course, was symptomatic pretty much from childhood, but lived at a time when no treatment was available. And by the time we treated her, when she was in her 60s, she had a severe decrease in platelet count, enlargement of the liver and spleen. And on the contrast, on the far uh, left of the screen is an individual who has Gaucher disease, relatively minimal abdominal distension due to organ enlargement and was in his mid to late 80s and never had required any treatment. There are three major classifications of Gaucher disease. The most common one that we see in the United States and in other Western European countries and in Israel is type 1 or non-neuronopathic disease. This disease is called a non-neuronopathic because by and large individuals do not have any evident involvement of the central nervous system and have no neurological symptoms until a small number at, an, at a relatively advanced age, uh, fifth, anywhere over 60, 70, occasionally earlier, can develop symptoms of Parkinsonism, which is one of the issues we'll discuss. You can also see again that the type 1 disease patterns, here I have a show a picture of an adolescent 15 to 16 year old girl, severely affected, and a boy, not, uh, or a man, young man, not much different in age, who has very totally mild or almost undetectable disease, and then a woman who unfortunately at the time when treatment was not available suffered some of the most severe consequences, bone disease which left her uh, confined to a wheelchair. Now, the type 2 acute neuronopathic disease can present either at birth, shortly after birth. Again, the first picture is a very, very severely affected child who had an extremely limited lifespan. You can again see the extensive systemic involvement, but also the flaccidity, uh, the position of the head, uh, the extremely poor development, and this type 2 variant, which is found in about 1 in 100,000 individuals and is not, unlike type 1 disease, more common among Ashkenazi Jews, but is found all over the world sporadically, and so far we have no effective treatment. The middle picture, the girl in the birthday crown, 
was a patient of mine who had what I could probably call type two and a half disease, somewhere between type two and three. She, uh, in this picture, was celebrating her third birthday and she looks very happy and vibrant, but sadly, she never made it to her fourth year of age as she developed very rapid neurological deterioration thereafter uh, and ended up dying of uh, problems with aspiration and respiratory deficiency. The third picture is there to remind you that type 2 disease and type 3 disease are found all over the world in different ethnicities. Uh, many patients in the Far East and the Near East who are affected do have these uh, particular variants. The type 3 or chronic neuropathic disease also occurs in about 1 in 100,000 individuals. There are a few populations in the world, particularly in an area of Sweden called Nurbatnia, and in some pockets in Poland and in Hungary, uh, who have uh, this chronic type uh, neuropathic disease more commonly than would be expected. Again, this disease has a very variable pattern. Some individuals get through childhood with symptoms, some develop symptoms, especially seizures and neurological deterioration as teenagers, and they tend to uh, die early. On the other hand, there are other individuals who have a more benign course. Some of them don't have very much more of symptomatology uh, in terms of the uh, CNS, other than eye movement disorders. Uh, some recent studies have shown that very few of them have any uh, impairment of intelligence and uh, many of them can actually live productively and work. And we know that with a treatment of the systemic disease, they can live to the 50s and possibly early 60s. So again, the heterogeneity of this disease is impressive. The two substrates of uh, the disease, uh, namely glucosyl ceramide or glucocerebroside, which we abbreviate as GL1, and a secondary substrate called lysogl one or glucosyl sphingosine are the substrates which accumulate to the greatest disease, to the greatest extent in Gaucher disease. Uh, particularly lysogl one which is a minor of the two substrates, is pathogenic and is apparently responsible for many of the complications associated with Gaucher disease. It's directly linked to bone mineral loss and osteopenia and osteoporosis and is also a significant antigen which can react with <clears throat> the B and T cells in the immune system, uh, eventually leading to immune stimulation, chronic inflammation, and we believe it is also linked to a somewhat unusual but significant complication in patients with Gaucher disease, ability to develop monoclonal gammopathy, myeloma, and perhaps other malignancies as well. The common symptoms of Gaucher disease can sort of be subdivided among those which uh, relate prominently to the liver, the spleen, and other reticuloendothelial organs, including the bone marrow, and consequently there, is effects on, there are effects on blood production, uh, decreased hematopoiesis as well as increased blood destruction due primarily to splenomegaly with the uh, hematopoietic defects being concentrated in impaired hematopoietic stem cell uh, production and differentiation in the bone marrow. As a result, many patients with Gaucher disease commonly develop low platelet counts also, patients commonly have anemia, although to some lesser extent, and some even have significant leukopenia. The bones, as I showed you before, in terms of that very severely affected individual, are another important focus of morbidity associated with Gaucher disease. You'll notice that uh, the bone can sort of be looked at in three components, the medullary or bone marrow component, the actual cortical bone or the strength uh, yielding aspect of the bone and of course the bone vasculature. And each of these three components can be affected in terms of serious bone disease. Effects on the vasculature lead to a complication such as a vascular or osteonecrosis as can be seen in this section of bone which was actually taken at an autopsy. This bone is a little unusual in the essentially shows virtually every complication that an individual can develop with bone disease, which includes infarction of the bone, the necrosis, as I mentioned, uh, 
osteosclerosis, infarction, thinning of the cortex, and even if you look at the overall triangular shape of this bone, development of, a, of an abnormality which is called Erlenmeyer flask after the uh, name of the chemistry flask uh, known as an Erlenmeyer flask. This deformity is again associated commonly with Gaucher disease but is not necessarily pathological. We usually, in real life, detect these abnormalities primarily uh, through MRI testing, and you can see that uh, the abnormalities can range anywhere from mild infiltration, these are the dark areas on these MRIs, to uh, bone involvement, which doesn't look very different than the pathology specimen that I just showed you.